Tyrion. He flew his dragon across the field and knocked over a catapult. The wood rolled noisily before coming to rest on a square of red, dark as blood by the candles in their tent. Predawn light had just begun spilling through the flap, but this was a morning that hadn't waited for the dawn. Huddled in a corner, sellswords spoke in hushed voices, their eyes heavy from a restless night. Do you hear your men whispering there? asked Tyrion Lannister, setting the fallen piece aside before easing back into his seat. It seems they're all anxious to know where the dragon will go next. Brown Ben Plum's weathered face was solemn. How? he grumbled, more to himself than to the dwarf. His eyes flicked about, studying the armies before him. Very slyly, how else? Tyrion gave the captain his most winning smile. In point of fact, he just made a very bad move, regretting it the moment he took his hand off the wing. He'd hung his spearmen. A player as good as Brown Ben would spot it soon enough, if he ever took his eyes off his own side of the board. My dragon is your bane, Lord Plum. A shame you no longer have one of your own. Within the tense gloom, the game was Sivas, a contest of reason and cunning. The moves and patterns upon the board showed a player's capabilities, his aptitude, the limits of his reach. The pieces laid out before a man reflected the sum of all his choices. They could tell you who he was, truly. And when Tyrion looked over the desperate position before him, he saw himself writ plain. Whatever ill luck he had had, all his moves had been his own, had they not? He had blundered in Selhoris when he eluded the half-maester in search of a brothel. Why? So I could mount a whore and cover myself in vomit? Stupid. Reckless. Pointless. Had he simply stayed with Halden, he might have been back in Westeros by now, beside a new boy king. Instead, Jorah Mormont had dragged him to Slaver's Bay and tangled them both in chains. He had gone to Brown Ben for his freedom, but what freedom was this? Though he called the old sellsword his commander, in truth Plum was his master, the captains of the Second Sons, his overseers. Lies and paper promises had kept Tyrion alive for the nonce, but one misstep, and they'd sell him to his sweet sister Cersei. That could be their plan already. What would convince them his head was worth more on his neck than off it? Plum was still puzzling over that last capture when the giant outside roared. Its arm creaked, its counterweight plunged. Chunk thump! And with that, the trebuchet had launched another load of corpses through the air. Pieces rattled. Candles danced. Sellswords winced. Wicked sister, Tyrion said. The sound was too close to have been the harridan. A loud bitch, though her voice is soothing next to Cersei's. But if noise alone could slay a dragon, Sir Sirwin would have armed himself with a pot and spoon. Old Sir Barristan must be having a jolly laugh at those machines right now. He has fire-breathing monsters, and the Yunkish, in all their wisdom, have laid against them six piles of kindling. Inkpots looked over, annoyed. Do not jape of dragons, half-man, and do not presume to know the mind of one, let alone two. Was that Greybeard laughing when the monsters burnt the city he's defending? Their own mother's city? Remember that? Tyrion was not like to forget. A tumult of shouting had erupted in the camp, so he'd hurried out from Inkpot's tent with his breeches still about his knees. But he hadn't found the men of the company preparing for battle, only standing aghast, mouths filling up with rain. There in the night sky above, strange figures swam amongst the clouds. Lurking. Hunting. Suddenly, arms of fire struck out, their sullen glare illuminating wet scales of green and white. The sight was as much a terror as a wonder. He'd only wished his Uncle Garion was there to see it with him. If Sir Grandfather leads a sortie, he'll ride a horse, not a dragon, Plum said. Those wild animals are like to devour him as us. He moved his own heavy horse forward on the board. A temporizing play. Had he spotted the blunder or hadn't he? A matter of who smells better cooked, I'm sure. Tyrion sniffed. Fires burned and fires were put out. Marine remains much as it has for thousands upon thousands of years. Great garish walls and all. 
If those dragons were truly wild, it would be a pile of cinders, and the Yunkai would have no need for this endless encirclement. They're trained animals. No doubt they just got too excited after a long captivity. My own pink dread has been known to do the same. Casporio the Cunning shook his head. Trained animals. Without a trainer. As well say pieces without a player. The Dragon Queen removed herself from the game in Daznak's pit. She will never command her dragons again. Not from beneath the waters of the Skahazadan. I wouldn't be so certain. Tyrion had no better move to make, so he answered one temporizing move with another, shifting his rabble one square over to block Plum's advance. No beautiful bloated body was found, nor any silver-haired splatter on the streets. We must assume she lives. Alive or dead, it matters not. She isn't here. Casporio crossed his arms. The Valentine fleet will be here. Any day now. Once they join their strength to Yunkai, Marine will fall. Then Daenerys is queen of nothing. Which do you think is swifter? Tyrion asked. Ships? Or dragons? You all sailed here from Volantis, yes? That journey nearly killed me. I pissed my hammock when there was too much wind. Ask Sir Jorah. He was bunked beneath me. But most days he kept dry down there because there was no wind. Not a breeze. I could have leapt overboard from boredom, but... Then there'd be no one to piss on Sir Jorah when the wind came back. Tell me, do you think a dragon is ever becalmed? Across the table, Brown Ben Plum scratched his salt and pepper beard. You yourself can't stay on a pig for half a minute. How long could she stay on a dragon? Long enough to cross a desert? A sea? There may be much that Daenerys Stormborn can teach me about bestriding beasts, Tyrion countered. Every child in Westeros knows the stories of the Targaryens and the Valyrians before them. They bent dragons to their will and could ride for hours, one castle to another. And the Silver Queen's will is one to fear, asked the Astapori. If I were her dragon, I wouldn't dare protest her wrapping those legs around me. Oh no, she could ride me as long as she liked. Tyrion hoped his face would not betray him. The sellsword was winning both within the tent and without. His breath stopped as Plum rested a finger on his elephant. Not that one, Tyrion prayed. Any peace but that one. A land spoke up. I thought they used horns. Magical things. Did your silver queen have one of them when she flew off? The question gave Tyrion pause. The history spoke at length of countless Targaryen heirlooms. Crowns and rings, swords and scepters, Trinket after trinket to proclaim each ruler's legitimacy. But never any horns. Her blood makes her a dragon rider, not some decorated trumpet, he decided, scoffing with unfelt confidence. She need only whistle for her dragon to do her bidding like a trained hound. There's that Lyseni play, Alan persisted vaguely. What's it called? The Waking of Pagaxes? Chunk thump, another trebuchet screamed. The canvas of the tent snapped. Is that the ghost of Astapor howling? Tyrion forced a chuckle. It seems the good masters agree with me. A glimmer of doubt winked in Brown Ben's almond-shaped eyes as he finally moved his trebuchet to collect Tyrion's spearmen. Inkpots nodded at the move. Then he turned to Tyrion and asked, If she does return, on Dragonback no less, what then? What would be the best play? For the Second Sons... To do what all sellswords do, surely. Join the side that will live to pay them. Pay us how, dwarf? In dragon's breath? Our company has turned twice already. From Yunkai to the Dragon Queen, then back again. She'll never trust us now. Even if she's not the sort to hold the grudge. And as to that... Inkpots let out a laugh. Ask the Astapori. Tyrion had no good response. So he returned his gaze to the board. My assault has been blocked. I must mount another attack before he has time to think. Tyrion moved his light horse to the left flank, then looked to Plum's second. Tell me, Caspo, in your years, what have you found is the worst thing about waiting for a battle? The captain looked suspicious, as if the question held some hidden jape. At length, he answered. The boredom, I'd say. You can't sleep. 
No one wants to talk. Nothing to do but sit and wait. He scratched the stubble on his chin. Why do you think I'm in here? Watching this bloody game. Boredom? Wondered Alan. What boredom? For hours the stomach twists. The heart thumps. But the worst is all the thinking. Your mind goes everywhere at once. Through every bad choice in your whole bad life. Finally leading you here, and now, to die. You replay the moves over and over. Spotting all the better paths you missed. What if you'd worked harder here? Just not run your mouth off there. What if you had kissed that Dornish girl? But the chance won't come again. You can't go back. Only forward, sword in hand. This may be our last sunrise, but we'll see no beauty in it. Only an echo of the thousand suns we've missed. A warrior poet, this one, Tyrion mused. Certainly, Inkpots responded mildly. But the very worst thing about waiting for battle, I think, is not knowing why this lying little imp would trick our company into its ruin. To cheat us of the considerable sum he swore to every man? The more to die, the fewer to collect? Is that the way of it? Inkpots tilted a quizzical head to Plum, who grinned as he brought his heavy horse up to strike at Tyrion's king. He ignored the paltry threat on the flank. So enlighten us, half-man. Why turn and turn and turn again, like a man who's searching for a dropped purse? What could we find but death? There had to be an answer. Tyrion scratched at his scar, considered, then moved his king behind a mountain. The more to die, the fewer to collect. You do me wrong, paymaster. That is your calculation to make. Here is mine. A thousand pounds of charred meat cannot win me casterly rock. He turned to meet the plump man's stare. Be good enough to survive till you've killed me mine enemies. Then I'll gladly pay each of you your gold. And Brown Ben his lordship. The captain would have his lordship at once. If he delivered your head to Queen Cersei. Casporio pointed out. That sent a shiver up the dwarf's spine. Casporio the cunt. He put on a warm smile. And what of the gold? He asked. For you? For ink pots, for a lan, the rest of the company. My member may be godly, yet I am not Trios, but a single bounty rests upon my neck. The only prize any of you will claim lies in the vaults of my castle. Casporio shrugged, a lan's eyebrows raised. Ink pots only drummed his fingers. But he had them. They can guess how generous they'd find Cersei. Brown Ben had plainly kept his mind on the game at hand. He shifted his trebuchet back across the board, a double attack on Tyrion's heavy horse and dragon. Chunk thump! A trebuchet outside boomed, loud and close. The Harridan, Tyrion said, largest of six nipples on a breastplate. The walls of Marine will hold till winter's come and gone, even if the Yunkishmen start firing rocks. They're firing something worse than rocks. The pale mare, Casporio spat. The shriveled knight has to come out. He can't rest his old bones now, while the bloody flux rains down and his people shit their lives out in the streets. The move is forced. Tyrion considered which of the pieces he valued more. Barristan the Bold is a seasoned knight, and veteran of a hundred battles. Such a man has survived all the perils of war, not just the pointy ones. I knew the man well at court. Selmy fears the bloody flux, as the High Septon fears a whore's pox. And he is wise enough to know not to give up a fortress. Then the girl general is much mistaken, Brown Ben Plum reflected. Malaza was quite confident that Sir Grandfather would strike today. Tyrion waved a dismissive hand. And how would she know that? Unless Selmy had a traitor somewhere in his midst. Chunk thump. Faint. Distant. Dragonbreaker. Tyrion named it as he pushed his dragon to safety. That was surely Mazdan's fist, Alan said, joining in Tyrion's game. A fine first guess, but that one sounded from the city's far side. Were your ears lopped off as well, said Casporio. It was closer. Dragonbreaker hasn't fired for hours. Perhaps you're right. Queer for it to become a silent sister, isn't it? Should we look for smoke rising over the walls? Perhaps the Dragon Queen has set a funeral pyre. 
Brown Ben Plum scanned the board briefly before collecting the heavy horse. If your beloved queen lives, and if she rides her dragon like a filly, and if she comes to break this siege, he glanced up at the dwarf, then how ought the second sons parley with her as to not meet Hargaz the hero's end? I've been waiting for you to ask, Lord Plum, Tyrion said graciously as his crossbowmen removed plums from the board. With hostages. What hostages? asked Alan. Casporio answered, The horse boy, the eunuch, and the whore. Some would call him a paramour, Plum said, without doing so himself. Dario Naharis, captain of the Stormcrows, a Dothraki co, and the unsullied second in command. They were given over when the fighting pits reopened, but the Yunkish never gave them back. His king took Tyrion's crossbowmen to complete the trade. Isn't that interesting? When Tyrion had spoken of hostages, he had only meant himself and Ser Jorah, sorry pair that they were. Pieces with actual value would be all the better. Tyrion's mind raced behind his knowing look. The Unsullied was just a soldier, one face among a thousand cockless spearmen. And who could say if she loved this sellsword any more vigorously than her other playthings? The Dothraki, on the other hand, he must be one of her oldest companions. How could she not care for that one? Them? I thought they were all put down, said Alan. Her admiral was butchered, and King Hisdar's kin returned, Plum mused. But the three of them remain. Tyrion advanced his rabble, so that the wise masters can strap them to the harridan and launch them over the walls most like. Each of them is worth his weight in gold, if the green crone spoke true, said Inkpots. Why waste the coin? That valuable, are they? The Yinkish have never been adept at counting coppers. A strange smile came over Tyrion, as the face of Peter Baelish crossed his mind unbidden. There's a man who appreciates the value of a hostage. And yet the antler men had been flung into the Blackwater, along with the debts they owed the crown. Had that been his plan? No, not his. Varys's, he decided. Those two were of a kind. Opposed but matching. One ebony piece and one werewood. One day Tyrion would sweep them both off the board. Casporio frowned. Whatever the wise masters elect to do with their prisoners, they're theirs, not ours. What would we do? Saunter up and ask to borrow them? No, it would require a timely rescue by cunning men. If only there were such men about. Tyrion watched Brown Ben advance his light horse forking Tyrion's spearmen and dragon. "'Tis a shame, is it not? Such a display would prove our sincerity to the Dragon Queen, beyond a doubt. Indeed, she would owe us a debt of gratitude. "'Yes, there is no greater atonement than to restore the Queen's bedwarmer,' Casporio said dryly. "'A gift as useful as a scepter.' "'The men are no use to anyone as they are, in chains, soon to be painting bricks,' Alan said." They would at least give us something to offer. A gesture of goodwill. Our goodwill, laughed Casporio. And what gesture of her goodwill can we expect in turn? Chunk thump, wicked sister thrummed again. Chunk thump, Harpy's daughter answered. Casporio has the right of it, judged Inkpots. The dwarf has never even met the queen. We will come to her with these loved ones, yes. But still, we will come as traitors. Once she has them back... Why not thank us warmly? Why? Because when our gift is made, I will interpose myself, Tyrion said. I am the lion who slew one of Daenerys Targaryen's fiercest adversaries, Tywin Lannister. My lord father massacred her good sister, her niece, her nephew. The boy was just a babe when they butchered him. For a moment, Tyrion wondered where young Griff was just then. He could be king even now or his head could be smashed in, for good this time. He retreated his dragon. And this generous, understanding monarch will welcome Tywin's son into her midst at once, because he claims to be a kinslayer. Casporio threw up a hand and turned an incredulous look to his captain. Brown Ben only smiled. Speaking of kin, he said as he took Tyrion's last spearman, I seem to recall your brother goes by another name. What was it again? Tyrion chuckled at the sally. 
I will give that dear brother of mine the same kindness I owe my sweet sister. But the woman who had her own brother put to death by the horse lords will not trouble herself over such a trifle as kinslaying, or kingslaying for that matter. Was Viserys not her liege? Tyrion lowered his voice. I have been the instrument of revenge, and can be so again. When she sees that, you can trust that she will look on me as a gift from the gods. Nothing less. Trust who, imp? Casporio demanded. Daenerys Stormborn. I remember her deceit at Yunkai. Mira was promised a day, but we were taken in the night. I remember the screams of a hundred and sixty-three great masters, nailed up in a line. Trust that woman who killed her brother, this man who killed his father. Should we trust the gods who have condemned us to this wasteland of pestilence and dragonfire? No more than she should, I think. And no more than she will. Tyrion studied the board. If a path to victory can be found at all, it lies outside the rules of the game. But why should that stop the imp? He advanced his dragon and looked up at his opponent. I am the lord of Casterly Rock. My father is dead. My brother, a knight of the Kingsguard, who can hold no lands. The castle is mine by right, along with its lands and along with its bannermen. Dragons alone will not take the Iron Throne when Daenerys at last turns west. She will need the Westermen. She will need swift men and the cavalry of pain. She will need foot and Staxpear and Yarwick with sword and spear and axe. The bow and arrow of Yu and Sarsfield. The crossbows of Drox and the ships of Farman. But above all, she will need gold. Lannister gold. My gold. You have a sister, don't you? asked Alan. An elder sister? Won't she claim the castle? You are pale for adornishment, Alan, Tyrion quipped. He remembered a conversation he'd had with the Red Viper, who'd spoken of Dornish law and what it might mean for Cersei. Those schemes ended when the mountain crushed his skull. We all know a brother's claim precedes his sister's. Inkpot sneered. Is that what our dragon lady thinks? Say you are the true heir, then, said Caspario the Cunning. A great lord by blood and birth. These bannermen, will they look at you and see a lord? The sellsword scowled, then looked him over top to bottom. All I see is a dwarf. Chunk thump! Tyrion pushed his dragon forward, let out a breath, and turned away from the board, as from a meal he'd lost interest in. Victory in six, my lord. Plum was nonplussed. Victory? In middle game? What move do you think you've forced? I could go here, or there. And no matter where you go, Lord Plum, the dragon always... Captain! The tense painted flap burst open, and a young messenger in a monkey tail hat rushed through. He must have been from E.T. There's news! Captain! Brown Ben was still searching for his defeat. Show me, dwarf, he said, disbelieving. Show me how. My captain, you must come, the man implored, desperate. You must. Quiet, you. Ships, Plum. This time it was Jorah Mormont's voice, sounding gruffly from beyond the flap. Ships on the horizon. Brown Ben stood. By the time his chair had settled, he'd traded one game for another. The Valentines? Tyrion's heart sank. No. I need more time. With ships here from Old Volantis, the Second Sons were not like to turn their cloaks. Not now. Just trading cogs and galleys in front, called young Kem from outside. But dozens behind, at least. They're flooding into the bay. Bring the dwarf, Plum commanded. Without a backward glance, he bolted from the tent. His men soon followed. Jorah came in long enough to tuck Tyrion under his arm, then joined the rest. Morning's twilight cast the eastern sky pink, but Slaver's Bay still belonged to the night. The horizon gave birth to shadows, one after the other, a litter of ghostly nothings. The silhouettes glided towards the shore, delivering darkness. The men of the Second Sons had abandoned their tents for the advent. A thousand eyes on the west. Sails! Brown Ben shouted, squinting. Someone tell me the sails! Black, said Jorah Mormont. It's still too dark. 
They're green, Casporio argued. Volantine galleys have green hulls and sails. Jorah shook his head. Black. That one there. Is that a... Kraken? Madness. Rank madness. Tyrion squirmed beneath his arm, trying to get a better look. The Ironborn are a world away. Mormont heard too many tales of Reavers as a boy on Bear Island. I see some red, insisted Alan. Red or black, you dolts? Tell me, Plum barked. Red and black, Jorah answered slowly. Then the big knight dropped the dwarf and shook with laughter. The Ironborn are flying. Dragon banners.